I'm reading this in memory of Damon, Jolene, Dan, Taze, and Ursula. May their memories be eternal. Funeral Oration on His Sister Gorgonia by St. Gregory Nazianzus. In praising my sister, I shall pay honor to one of my own family, yet my praise will not be false because it is given to a relation, but because it is true, will be worthy of commendation, and its truth is based not only upon its justice, but upon well-known facts. For even if I wished, I should not be permitted to be partial, since everyone who hears me stands like a skillful critic between my oration and the truth, to discountenance exaggeration, yet if he be a man of justice, demanding what is really due. So that my fear is not of outrunning the truth, but on the contrary, of falling short of it, and lessening her just repute by the extreme inadequacy of my panegyric. For it is a hard task to match her excellences with suitable action and words. Let us not then be so unjust as to praise every characteristic of other folk and disparage really valuable qualities because they are our own, so as to make some men gain by their absence of kindred with us, while others suffer for their relationship. For justice would be violated alike by the praise of the one and the neglect of the other. Whereas if we make the truth our standard and rule, and look to her alone, disregarding all the objects of the vulgar and the mean, we shall praise or pass over everything according to its merits. Yet it would be most unreasonable of all if, while we refuse to regard it as a righteous thing to defraud, insult, accuse, or treat unjustly in any way, great or small, those who are our kindred, and consider wrong done to those nearest to us the worst of all, were we yet to imagine that it would be an act of justice to deprive them of such an oration as is due most of all to the good, and spend more words upon those who are evil and beg for indulgent treatment than on those who are excellent and merely claim their due. For if we are not prevented, as would be far more just, from praising men who have lived outside our own circle, because we do not know and cannot personally testify to their merits, shall we be prevented from praising those whom we do know because of our friendship, or the envy of the multitude, and especially those who have departed hence, whom it is too late to integrate ourselves with, since they have escaped, among all other things, from the reach of praise or blame. Having now made a sufficient defense on these points, and shown how necessary it is for me to be the speaker, come and let me proceed with my eulogy. Rejecting all daintiness and elegance of style, for she whom we are praising was unadorned, and the absence of ornament was to her beauty. And yet, performing as a most indispensable debt all those funeral rites which are due to her, and further instructing everyone in a zealous imitation of the same virtue, since it is my object in every word and action to promote the perfection of those committed to my charge. The task of praising the country and family of our departed one I leave to another, more scrupulous in adhering to the rules of a eulogy. Nor will he lack many fair topics. If he wished to deck her with external ornaments, as men deck a splendid and beautiful form with gold and precious stones and the artistic devices of the craftsmen, which, while they accentuate ugliness by their contrast, can add no attractiveness to the beauty which surpasses them. For my part, I will only conform to such rules so far as to allude to our common parents, for it would not be reverent to pass unnoticed the great blessing of having parents, such parents and teachers, and then speedily direct my attention to herself without further taxing the patience 
of those who are eager, eager to learn what manner of a woman she was. From them, Gorgonia derived both her existence and her reputation. They sowed in her the seeds of piety. They were the source of her fair life and of her happy departure with better hopes. Fair privileges these, and such as are not easily attained by many of those who plume themselves highly upon their noble birth and are proud of their ancestry. But if I must treat of her case in a more philosophic and lofty strain, Gorgonia's native land was Jerusalem above. Hebrews 12, 22 through 23, the object, not of sight, but of contemplation wherein is our commonwealth, and whereto we are pressing on, whose citizen Christ is, and whose fellow citizens are the assembly and church of the firstborn, who are written in heaven, and feast around its great founder in contemplation of his glory, and take part in the endless festival. Her nobility consisted in the preservation of the image, and the perfect likeness to the archetype, which is produced by reason and virtue and pure desire, ever more and more conforming in things pertaining to God, to those truly initiated into the heavenly mysteries, and in knowing whence and of what character and for what end we came into being. This is what I know upon these points, and therefore it is that I both am aware and assert that her soul was more noble than those of the East. Job 1 verse 3, according to a better than the ordinary rule of noble or ennoble birth, whose distinctions depend not on blood, but on character. Nor does it classify those whom it praises or blames according to their families, but as individuals. But speaking as I do of her excellences among those who know her, let each one join in contributing some particular and aid me in my speech. For it is impossible for one man to take in every point, however gifted with observation and intelligence. In modesty, she so greatly excelled and so far surpassed those of her own day to say nothing of those of old time who have been illustrious for modesty, that in regard to the two divisions of the life of all, that is, the married and the unmarried state, the latter being higher and more divine, though more difficult and dangerous, while the former is more humble and more safe, she was able to avoid the disadvantages of each and to select and combine all that is best in both, namely the elevation of the one and the security of the other, thus becoming modest without pride, blending the excellence of the married with that of the unmarried state, and proving that neither of them absolutely binds us to or separates us from God or the world, so that the one from its own nature must be utterly avoided and the other altogether praised, but that it is mind which nobly presides over wedlock and maidenhood and arranges and works upon them as the raw material of virtue under the master hand of reason. For though she had entered upon a carnal union, she was not therefore separated from the spirit, nor because her husband was her head did she ignore the first head. But performing those few ministrations due to the world and nature according to the will of the law of the flesh, or rather of him who gave to the flesh these laws, she consecrated herself entirely to God. But what is most excellent and honorable, she also won over her husband to her side and made of him a good fellow servant instead of an unreasonable master. And not only so, but she further made the fruit of her body, her children and her children's children, to be the fruit of her spirit, dedicating to God not her single soul, but the whole family and household, 
and making wedlock illustrious through her own acceptability in wedlock, and the fair harvest she had reaped thereby, presenting herself as long as she lived. As an example of her as an example to her offspring of all that was good, and when summoned hence, leaving her will behind her as a silent exhortation to her house. The divine Solomon, in his instructive wisdom, I mean his Proverbs, praises the woman, Proverbs 31.10, who looks to her household and loves her husband, contrasting her with the one who roams abroad and is uncontrolled and and dishonorable and hunts for precious souls with wanton words and ways, while she manages well at home and bravely sets about her woman's duties as her hands hold the distaff and she prepares two coats for her husband, buying a field in due season and makes good provision for the food of her servants and welcomes her friends at a liberal table with all the other details in which he signs the praises of the modest and industrious woman. Now, to praise my sister in these points would be to praise a statue for its shadow or a lion for its claws without allusion to its greatest perfections. Who was more deserving of renown and yet who avoided it so much and made herself inaccessible to the eyes of man? Who knew better the due proportions of sobriety and cheerfulness so that her sobriety should not seem inhuman nor her tenderness immodest, but prudent in one, gentle in the other, Her discretion was marked by a combination of sympathy and dignity. Listen, you women addicted to ease and display, who despise the veil of shamefastness, who ever so kept her eyes under control, who so derided laughter that the ripple of a smile seemed a great thing to her, who more steadfastly closed her ears, and who opened them more to the divine words, or rather, who installed the mind as a ruler of the tongue in uttering the judgments of God, who, as she, regulated her lips. Here, if you will, is another point of her excellence, one of which neither she nor any truly modest and decorous woman thinks anything, but which we have been made to think much of by those who are too fond of ornament and display and refuse to listen to instruction on such matters. She was never adorned with gold wrought into artistic forms of surpassing beauty, nor flaxen tresses fully or partially displayed, nor spiral curls, nor dishonoring designs of men who construct erections on the honorable head nor costly folds of flowing and transparent robes, nor graces of brilliant stones, which color the neighboring air and cast a glow upon the form, nor the arts and witcheries of the painter, nor that cheap beauty of the infernal creator who works against the divine, hiding with his treacherous pigments the creation of God and putting it to shame with his honor, in setting before eager eyes the imitation of a harlot instead of the form of God, so that this bastard beauty may steal away that image which should be kept for God and from the wor- and for the world to come. But though she was aware of the many and various external ornaments of women, yet none of them was more precious to her than her own character and the brilliancy stored up within. One red tint was dear to her, the blush of modesty, one white one, the sign of temperance. But pigments and pencilings and living pictures and flowing lines of beauty she left to women of the stage and of the streets, and to all who think it a shame and a reproach to be ashamed. 
who opened her house to those who live according to God with a more graceful and bountiful welcome. And which is greater than this, who bade them welcome with such modesty and godly greetings? Further, who showed a mind more unmoved in sufferings, whose soul was more sympathetic to those in trouble, whose hand more liberal to those in want. I should not hesitate to honor her with the words of Job. Her door was opened to all comers. The stranger did not lodge in the street. She was eyes to the blind, feet to the lame, a mother to the orphan. Why should I say more of her compassion to widows than that its fruit which she obtained was never to be called a widow herself? Her house was a common abode to all the needy of her family, and her goods no less common to all in need than their own belonged to each other. She has dispersed abroad and given to the poor, and according to the infallible truth of the gospel, she laid up much in store in the wine presses above, and oftentimes entertained Christ in the person of those whose benefactress she was. And best of all, there was in her no unreal profession but in secret she cultivated piety before him who sees secret things. Everything she rescued from the ruler of this world, everything she transferred to the safe of garners, nothing did she leave behind to earth save her body. She bartered everything for the hopes above. The sole wealth she left to her children was the imitation of her example and the emulation of her merits. But amid these tokens of incredible magnanimity, she did not surrender her body to luxury and unrestrained pleasures of the appetite, that raging and tearing dog, as though presuming upon her acts of benevolence, as most men do who redeem their luxury by compassion to the poor, and instead of healing evil with good, receive evil as a recompense for their good deeds. Nor did she, while subduing her dust by fasting, leave to another the medicine of hard lying, nor, while she found this of spiritual service, was she less restrained in sleep than anyone else, nor, while regulating her life on this point as if freed from the body, did she lie upon the ground when others were passing the night erect, as the most mortified men struggled to do? Nay, in this respect, she was seen to surpass not only women, but the most devoted of men. By her intelligent chanting of the Psalter, her converse with and unfolding an apposite recollection of the divine oracles, Her bending of her knees, which had grown hard and almost taken root in the ground. Her tears to cleanse her stains with contrite heart and spirit of loneliness. Her prayer rising heavenward. Her mind freed from wandering in rapture. In all these, or in any one of them, is there a man or woman who can boast of having surpassed her? Besides, It is a great thing to say, but it is true that while she was zealous in her endeavor after some points of excellence, of others she was the paragon, of some she was the discoverer, in others she excelled. And if in some singular particular she was rivaled, her superiority consists in her complete grasp of all. Such was her success in all points as none else attained even in a moderate degree in one, to such perfection did she attain in each particular, that any one might of itself have supplied the place of all. O untended body and squalid garments, whose only flower is virtue, O soul, clinging to the body, when reduced almost to an immaterial state through lack of food, or rather, when the body had been mortified by force, even before dissolution, that the soul might attain to freedom and escape the entanglements of the, sen- of the senses. O nights of vigil 
and psalmody and standing which lasts from one day to another. O David, whose strains never seem tedious to faithful souls. O tender limbs, flung upon the earth and, contrary to nature, growing hard. O fountains of tears, sowing in affliction that they might reap in joy. O cry in the night, piercing the clouds and reaching unto him that dwells in the heavens. O fervor of spirit, waxing bold in prayerful longings against the dogs of the night and frosts and rain and thunders and hail and darkness. O nature of woman overcoming that of man in the common struggle for for salvation and demonstrating that the distinction between male and female is one of body, not of soul. O baptismal purity, O soul, in the pure chamber of your body, the bride of Christ, O bitter eating, O Eve, mother of our race and of our sin, O subtle serpent and death, overcome by her self-discipline, O self-emptying of Christ and form of a servant and sufferings, honored by her mortification. How am I to count up all of her traits or pass over most of them without injury to those who know them not? Here, however, it is right to subjoin the rewards of her piety, for indeed I take it that you, who knew her life well, have long been eager and desirous to find in my speech not only things present or her joys yonder, beyond the conception and hearing and sight of man, but also those which the righteous rewarder bestowed upon her here, a matter which often tends to the edification of unbelievers, who from small things attain to faith in those which are great, and from things which are seen to those which are not seen. I will mention them then some facts which are generally notorious, others which have been from most men kept secret, and that because her Christian principle made a point of not making a display of her divine favors. You know how her maddened mules ran away with her carriage and unfortunately overturned it, how horribly she was dragged along and seriously injured to the scandal of unbelievers at the permission of such accidents to the righteous and how quickly their unbelief was corrected for all crushed and bruised as she was in bones and limbs alike in those exposed and in those out of sight, she would have none of any physician except God who had permitted it, both because she shrunk from the inspection in the hands of men, preserving even in suffering her modesty, and also awaiting her justification from God who allowed this to happen, so that she owed her preservation to none other than him with the result that men were no less struck by her unhoped-for recovery than by her misfortune, and concluded that the tragedy had happened for her glorification through sufferings, the suffering being human, the, co- the recovery superhuman, and giving a lesson to those who come after, exhibiting in a high degree faith in the midst of suffering and patience under calamity, but in a still higher degree, the kindness of God to them that are such as she. For to the beautiful promise to the righteous, though he fall, he shall not be utterly broken, has been added one more recent. Though though he be utterly broken, he shall speedily be raised up and glorified. For if her misfortune was unreasonable, her recovery was extraordinary so that health soon stole away the injury, and the cure became more celebrated than the blow. Such was her life. Most of its details I have left untold, lest my speech should grow to undue proportions, and lest I should seem to be too greedy for her fair fame. But perhaps we should be wronging her holy and illustrious death did we not mention some of its excellences, especially as she so longed for and desired it. I will do so, therefore, as concisely as I can. 
She longed for her dissolution, for indeed she had great boldness towards him who called her, and preferred to be with Christ beyond all things on earth. And there is none of the most amorous and unrestrained who has such love for his body as she had to fling away these fetters and escape from the mire in which we spend our lives, and to associate in purity with him who is fair, and entirely to hold her beloved, who is, I will even say it, her lover, by whose rays, feeble though they are now, we are enlightened, and whom, though separated from him, we are able to know. Nor did she fail even of this desire, divine and sublime though it was, and, what is still greater, she had a foretaste of his beauty through her forecast and constant watching. Her only sleep transferred her to exceeding joys, and her one vision embraced her departure at the fore-appointed time, having been made aware of this day, so that according to the decision of God she might be prepared and yet not disturbed. She had recently obtained the blessing of cleansing and perfection, which we have all received from God as a common gift and foundation of our new life or rather all her life was a cleansing and perfecting. And while she received regeneration from the Holy Spirit, its security was hers by virtue of her former life. And in her case almost alone, I will venture to say the mystery was a seal rather than a gift of grace. And when her husband's perfection was her one remaining desire, in order that she might be consecrated to God in her whole body, and not depart half perfected or leave behind her imperfect anything that was hers. She did not even fail of this petition from him who fulfills the desire of them that fear him and accomplishes their requests. And now when she had all things to her mind and nothing was lacking of her desires and the appointed time drew near being less prepared for death and departure, she fulfilled the law which prevails in such matters and took to her bed. After many injunctions to her husband, her children, and her friends, as was to be expected from one who was full of conjugal, maternal, and brotherly love, and after making her last day a day of solemn festival with brilliant discourse upon the things above, she fell asleep full not of the days of man for which she had no desire knowing them to be evil for her and mainly occupied with our dust and wanderings but more exceedingly full of the days of god than i imagine any one of those who have departed in a wealth of hoary hairs and have numbered many terms of years thus she was set free or it is better to say, taken to God, or flew away, or changed her abode, or anticipated by a little the departure of her body. It is a great point for her distinction and in our memory of her virtue and regret for her departure. But trembling and tears have seized upon me at the recollection of the wonder. She was just passing away, and at her last breath, surrounded by a group of relatives and friends performing the last offices of kindness, while her aged mother bent over her, with her soul convulsed with envy of her departure, anguish and affection being blended in the minds of all. Some longed to hear some burning word to be branded in their recollection. Others were eager to speak, yet no one dared, for tears were mute and the pangs of grief unconsoled, since it seemed sacrilegious to think that mourning could be an honor to one who was thus passing away. So there was solemn silence, as if her death had been a religious ceremony. There she lay, to all appearance breathless, motionless, speechless, The stillness of her body seemed paralysis, 
as though the organs of speech were dead, after that which could move them had gone. But as her pastor, who in this wonderful scene was carefully watching her, perceived that her lips were gently moving and placed his ear to them, which his disposition and sympathy emboldened him to do. But do you expound the meaning of this mysterious calm? For no one can disbelieve it on your word. Under her breath, she was repeating a psalm. The last words of a psalm. To say the truth, a testimony to the boldness with which she was departing, and blessed is he who can fall asleep with these words. I will lay me down in peace and take my rest. Thus were you singing, fairest of women, and thus it fell out unto you, and the song became a reality, and attended on your departure as a memorial of you, who hast entered upon sweet peace after suffering, and received, over and above the rest which comes to all, that sleep which is due to the beloved, as befitted one who lived and died amid the words of piety. Better, I know well, and far more precious than I can see, is your present lot, the song of them that keep holy day, the throng of angels, the heavenly host, the vision of glory, and that splendor, pure and perfect beyond all other, of the Trinity Most High, no longer beyond the ken of the captive mind, dissipated by the senses, but entirely contemplated and possessed by the undivided mind, and flashing upon our souls with the whole light of Godhead. May you enjoy to the full all of those things whose crumbs you did while still upon earth. Possess through the reality of your inclination towards them. And if you take any account of our affairs, and holy souls receive from God this privilege, do you accept these words of mine in place of and in preference to many panegyrics which I have bestowed upon Caesarius before you and upon you after him, since I have been preserved to pronounce panegyrics upon my brethren? If anyone will, after you, pay me the like honor, I cannot say. Yet may my only honor be that which is in God, and may my pilgrimage and my home be in Christ Jesus our Lord, to whom, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, be glory forever. Amen.